We are celebrating a great Canadian tonight who broke so many barriers that not even the planet is a large enough platform for her incredible accomplishments. Lift off of the Space Shuttle Discovery and the first international microgravity laboratory. 30 years ago, Dr. Roberta Bonder circled the Earth for eight days, the first Canadian woman and first neurologist to go to space. It was an affirmation of not only her dream, but an inspiration for so many other women and girls, myself included, the pride of her hometown, Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. We're so happy to have you with us, uh, Dr. Bonder. I actually can't believe it's 30 years, but how vivid is it for you? I mean, did that view of Earth from above alter the rest of your life on the ground? Absolutely did. It was the reality of the moment of actually seeing it as a planet and seeing, not seeing actually any life below, but seeing all these beautiful colors and geography that we learned in school. And it just really made me want to pay a bit more attention to what was on the surface of the planet. So I really couldn't wait to get back to what I call my astronaut ex exploration phase of my life. Before that, though, I mean, I want to even go back just a little further. 1992, can you put us in your mind at that moment? Time certainly mellows emotion, but were you scared? I think if a person doesn't have a little twinge of fear when you're going inside a vehicle, it looks like it's about to eat you alive. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> but, uh, when we train professionally and have to deal with some of these things, like a firefighter going into a burning building, uh, or any kind of professional going into some situation. We try to train the best we can, but we can't necessarily train for the exact situation, but we can train how to think. But, you know, the Challenger disaster had been not that many years prior. I can imagine for, for your whole family, this was a very dramatic, tr certainly a proud moment, but a traumatic one also. Well, it was. I mean, you, you put it very well. The Challenger accident happened, and my father died very suddenly before the Challenger accident. And then my mother was an only child. I would have, if anything happened to me, would have left my sister without a sibling. I really had to look at the kinds of, I think, risks that I was putting my family into my slipstream. Because I wanted to accept certain risks, it wasn't necessarily what I should have expected my family to accept, but they did, and they wanted me to go forth and, and do these things because they knew that it had been my passion. But I think they really appreciated my wanting to, to talk about it and reflect, reflect on the actual danger and, and the kinds of things that, that one needs to do sometimes when one is trying to be a pioneer. You know, I've always been fascinated. You've talked about the fact of what you didn't hear when you were there for those eight days and the sound of birds and how that ultimately has impacted your life. It certainly has impacted my life. This not hearing anything that were earth sounds or any sounds from nature. I mean, one can have it on a tape, but it's not the same thing. Mm. It's, it's just, a, it's a difficult thing to describe, but it's in a three dimensional world. And I, I relate, I think, to people who are starting to lose their hearing and trying to, trying to hang on to some memories that they know that eventually maybe they're not going to have anymore in, in real time. That's the kind of thing that if one's not prepared for, it becomes quite a void, that there's not the things that you just associate with life and maybe good mental health. But it also built your life as a conservationist on some level. Would you agree with that, or was that always there? I trained for many, many years in uh, ecology and zoology. I mean, uh, all my degrees, my first set of degrees were all based on, on, on biological systems. And certainly as a summer student, I worked on insects and always did field trips. My parents always had us tenting. And so we had quite a discovery moment anytime we were out in the natural world. So as I was training for a space flight, I really wanted to understand that when I got up there, I had the opportunity of seeing something. I mean, that was the looking at all these Earth observation photographs before I left. I mean, I just went through so much stuff to prepare myself. I didn't have to do it. I wanted to do it. So I got into space. I wanted to see something in a different way. Just fascinating to hear this. And I know you went there, though, as a neurologist. So let's talk about medical advancements. Do you see the results of your work in space and the subsequent years in medicine today? 
there's no question that all these space experiments lead to the next set of experiments. And we try at some point, there's never an end to it for sure, because there's always an, the next question or the next 10 questions being asked of some result. My particular research that I worked on for, I supported something like two dozen missions uh, for cosmonauts and astronauts at Mir and the shuttle program as well. They were all about how human beings can adapt to spaceflight, but how they can readapt to Earth's gravitational field. So I was specifically looking at blood flow to the brain. I headed an international research team working with NASA to look at some of these aspects of, of how our body can best adapt to spaceflight and on return, and then use some of those spinoffs to look at patients with diseases that have similar symptoms. It is very revealing when we go into space, and all we've done is go into free fall. But there are certain systems in the body that we don't fully understand here on Earth. And some of it is because mechanisms are hidden. Uh, but when we go into space, some of these mechanisms become quite apparent. And it's trying to look at them. And I can just tell you that I postulated many, many years ago, decades ago, that one of the issues that we faced in space when we started feeling sick was that there's a fluid shift uh, from the lower body up into the head. And I thought, well, there's no reason why the brain, which is mainly water, doesn't float as well, some of the solutions in the brain or the fluid in the cells. And only now are people actually doing the research work and looking at that because people are coming back from long-term space flights with visual loss mm. that they believe is because of raised pressure inside the head due to these fluid shifts. So we were really ahead of our time, but it's really good to know that we're trying to get to the bottom of this and by doing so, we can help people here on the planet as well. Mm -hmm. And gratifying, I should think, to know that there is follow through. But, you know, in just what you're saying, you had the best science degrees from the best universities, eight years of training for eight days in space. But now going to space seems less about science and more about being a billionaire. And I wonder what you think about these space junkets. Do they cheapen the work done by real astronauts? Well, I think maybe it just points to the ethics of the people who are developing these systems. I mean, we like to think that there's some technology spinoffs and things we can learn for, for other people to access space in a different way. But when you start seeing billionaires just going up to play with smarties mm. <laughs> and you think that this is contributing to some problems here on the ground, whether it's building a, a, a launch facility somewhere near or within a wildlife uh, situation mm. where habitat really is being decimated uh, for things like birds in our natural environment. One just has to think, well, what is the ethics? What are the ethics around that? I think that's the, the big question. Uh, it's not, we can't decide for somebody else how they spend their money, but we would hope that by the time they get to a certain, uh, a, a certain reputation and credibility, that they would use that wisely to help the world as well. And is anybody listening to someone like you with such a vast experience having been in space when you mount concerns over these very real situations now unfolding? I think people want to, they want to listen. Uh, and I think we just have to point to William Shatner's landing on the, the, the blue horizon that he was on, the, the blue origin rather, for Jeff Bezos, when Shatner came off, and he, I'm sure he must have had a script in his head, but he comes off and he starts waxing very eloquently about his flight and about this thin blue mm. line that separates Earth from the black of danger of space. And while he's speaking these words, very emotional for him, Jeff Bezos walks off and gets a bottle of champagne to spray at everybody. I mean, Bezos walked out on these words, and Shatner stepped back. And he, Shatner was very, very kind after. He said, well, you know, it's his spacecraft, and, you know, it's great to be able to get people up there to see this. But that, that scene, to me, reflects the, the part that is, makes people think that spaceflight is just a game now. You know, anybody can go. I think there, there, people still don't realize the danger of it, and let's face it, Shot went up for about 25 seconds of free fall. Mm -hmm. Some of the other vehicles can last longer. But I think that when people start going to the moon, there'll probably be renewed interest again because people haven't been there since the 70s. Which is shocking in itself. Wouldn't you agree? Well, I do. I mean, I, I personally always felt we should have gone to the moon and not space station. But the politics at the time were such that they wanted to do something 
to continue space exploration and people didn't have the, I don't think people had the charisma to be able to put this across to people, some idea, because you had other astronauts saying, we've been to the moon. Well, if you look at the moon, where did they land? I mean, you can't with your human eyes see where people landed on the moon. You sort of know the general area. People have been have sent robotic systems to the backside of the moon, but never a human being. So we've got a lot to learn. Just even trying to think about going elsewhere, whether it's to asteroids or Mars, we need to be off the planet to be able to do that. And what better place than the moon? Mm. Well, you know, you just mentioned the, the International Space Station. So let's talk about that. It's showing its age. Is it still money well spent with, with enough useful science justifying the cost or does space exploration need a reboot well it's probably a bit of both uh, certainly lots of stuff ages i mean heavens i do and i think i still got some life left in me uh, one would hope that the international community will be able to keep the space station going i mean there is talk of selling part of it off to private concerns uh, it there's something to be said for the research that's being done on it and there's something to be said for taking that and doing it elsewhere as well. So the kinds of things we learn about growing plants in space, about developing closed ecosystems, about how bacteria and viruses work. I mean, it's very important that, that we're continue on the space station till we have the next, the next rung up the ladder. So much has changed, and on the issue of ladder, um, certainly your <laughs> space flight was considered a breakthrough for women, but was it? I mean, only 12% in total have been women who've been in space. Well, it's true, and it is a bit shocking. I think the other thing that's shocking is that there's not a huge distribution of people in North America reflecting necessarily the population. And I, I feel very strongly that, that's, that some of it has to be based on opportunity given to all North Americans, whether they're Americans or Canadians, at various levels of education, uh, that people's race and culture are not, or, or whatever the gender is, mm -hmm. are not used to preclude advancement at whatever level. Because you can't apply for something like the astronaut program without having accumulated uh, a, a certain pedigree of life experience or education and qualifications. And if we don't have people able to access all of that, it's not going to be reflected because nobody wants to be hired because they were an affirmative action plan at that level. We want people to get in and improve themselves on a case, but we don't want people precluding these individuals. So I think we have a, a long way to go when we look at how we select individuals for this end of the spectrum, when we haven't really paid enough attention or given enough impetus to the other the other side of it, which is the preparation even to try to to, to become a candidate. And, and you know, for all the, the young girls and boys watching this, you know, you had the bravery to face the unknown 30 years ago. And I wonder what your advice is right now for people facing the unknown, certainly this pandemic and, of course, the existential threat of climate change. Yes, there are many things that we uh, we have ongoing apart from trying to get into space, which is a dangerous thing to do. We all face danger in our lives for sure, every day. I mean, driving, going out and shoveling snow or, or whatever it is we do, we take risks all the time. And we just try to get them in our head and say, okay, but this is how I mitigate that risk. I'm, I'm gonna put gloves on, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do this. I'm, I'm gonna go out and have an avalanche kit if I go skiing whatever the preparation is. And that's what we do to combat any kind of fear that, that we feel. Uh, I do believe that, that, that science is extremely important to all of us. And I think when young people, it doesn't matter what one wants to, to do, whether it's being a plumber, a pipe fitter, a, wood, a woodworker, being a nurse, being a doctor, being a lawyer, being an artist, being a policeman, fire person, it doesn't matter you still have to have some grasp to be able to diminish the fear. And when one understands about fires and how fires start and combustible materials, one is a much better firefighter. When one knows about physical training, all of these things require some knowledge of science. Mm. So I firmly believe that I would, my advice would be, be diverse in the background. Arts helps us create and express ourselves. Science also helps us 
develop certain skill sets, but it does diminish the fear factor. Mm, education. Roberta Bonder, happy anniversary to you. 30 years and we are still learning from you. Well, I'm still learning from everybody else too, so it's a, it's a good combination. We are going to continue this conversation on our website after the show. And this Saturday, to celebrate the 30-year milestone, Dr. Bonder is hosting a virtual event joined by celebrity friends, including Anne-Marie. Proceeds will go to the Roberta Bonder Foundation. For all that, more information, just go to ctvnews.ca.